Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, Secretary Newland, in your statement, you outline our goal as threefold. First, we want peace, then political normalization, and then ultimately the return to borders, which I imagine includes Crimea as well. The question that I have is how realistic, and, and the hope is that Minsk would offer that promise, with peace coming first as the precondition for all these things to be possible. The question that I have is how realistic is that goal, given the goals that Putin has himself? I think the goal, and unless any of you dispute this, I think the goal Putin has here is to basically, it's not just about Ukraine, it's about completely reorganizing the post-Cold War, post-Soviet era uh, order in Europe. And that, it's not just about Ukraine. And in, the, in that context, that's why he wants to weaken and divide and perhaps even uh, force NATO to fall apart. In fact, he's questioned why we even need a NATO anymore since there's no more Soviet Union. Uh, as part of furthering that goal, he's openly said that they believe they need to establish a sphere of influence, and not just throughout the former Soviet space, but also in former War Warsaw Pact-type countries. Uh, this whole talk about protecting Russian speakers, this is just an excuse that he puts out there as a justification before the international community for moving forward. But ultimately, their, their goal, their ultimate goal here is to carve out, to reorder the post-Soviet order in the region, and to carve out for Russia a strategic space that, that for themselves of influence. It, it, and so in light of that, why should we have any hope that these uh, ceasefires are actually going to hold, given we know what his ultimate goal is? Now, he may agree to a temporary ceasefire as a tactical move, maybe hopefully to split us off from the Europeans, in essence, hoping for us. And, and, and maybe that's why uh, there's been arguments that we shouldn't go on sanctions alone, because it could cause a friction with the European Union and split us from them. Uh, in that regard, but at the end of the day, he may agree to a ceasefire temporarily, either to consolidate gains they've already made, or to perhaps try to create a, a point of friction between uh, hoping that we'll jump out ahead of the Europeans and create that as a division. But ultimately, his goal, unquestionably, is to completely rearrange the order in this area and carve out for Russia a sphere of influence. So why, how is it even realistic, given knowing that about him, to think that he's ever going to allow stabilization to return to Ukraine and that he's ever going to return back to their borders, given we know what their goal is. I mean, if one, he's a criminal and a thug, but he's also a very determined one who has shown the willingness to act out in furtherance of a strategic goal. So why should I feel optimistic that there's any chance of that happening, given, given the goal he has now, unless the cost-benefit analysis changes for him? Senator, I'm not going to dispute any of your analysis. I'm simply going to say that Minsk is a test for Russia. Russia signed it. The separatists signed it. It's also a choice for Russia. If fully implemented, it would bring back uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity in the east. It doesn't obviously address Crimea. So now we have to test. And as I said at the beginning, the record is already mixed today. And we have to be ready, both for uh, the opportunity for success, but also to impose more costs, significant costs on Russia with our European partners if Minsk is violated, either because the agreement's not implemented or because there's a further land grab or because the separatists are further armed. And that's what we're watching. So in furtherance of that question, if in fact this is a test, what is wrong with now laying out clearly exactly what we're going to do if that test has failed? In essence, if this test fails, we're going to arm the Ukrainians with, by, by the way, as a sovereign country, Ukraine has a right to defend itself, not just against Russian aggression or separatist aggression, but any aggression. If, in fact, we're trying to, to strengthen uh, the, the, the writ of that government, uh, part of that is allowing them to provide for their own defense. But, so we should be doing that anyways. But w is, is it the position of the administration that we're going to lay out a clear picture, hopefully with our European partners, about what the specific sanctions will be and what specific military aid will provide if Russia fails the Minsk test? Uh, Senator, I think in my opening I made clear that we are working now with the Europeans to lay out concrete sanctions costs if Minsk is not implemented or further violated. Uh, we generally don't signal those in advance, but we make clear that we are uh, prepared and that's what we're working on. With regard to security assistance, we are continuing to evaluate that based on the situation on the ground and implementation of Minsk will very much be part of that. Can you comment on whether denying Russia access to the SWIFT system is something that's been discussed? Um, we actually generally don't discuss in a public forum uh, any specific measures, um, 
but we discuss a whole range of things. As we're evaluating it, we look at both the impact that it would have on Russia, as well as the spillovers that it would have on the global economy, the United States, and our European partners. But I don't want to comment on any specific action. Irrespective, my last question, I guess, this is more of a, I know that it's, maybe I don't expect you to comment on this, but irrespective of whether Russia adheres to Minsk or not, is it not, if, if in fact we want to stabilize Ukraine, isn't part of that stabilization to give them the ability to defend themselves in the future from any other aggression that may exist? In essence, there are other countries that haven't been invaded who we provide military assistance to and defense assistance to because we understand that the absence of it invites aggression in the future. I just want to know why is it a bad idea to provide them defense assistance irrespective? Uh, and I know that's being reviewed, but Mike, is there an argument to be made against providing defensive weapons to a country irrespective of how the ceasefire turns out uh, uh, since we're trying to help them stabilize their government and as part of that it has to be the ability to provide for their national defense. Uh, Senator Rubio, as you know, we have provided a, a range of security assistance in the non-lethal categories which have met real Ukrainian security requirements because the armed forces were not fully stripped bare but they were left rather lacking by the corruption of the last regime. And I expect long past this crisis, we will have a defense partnership with the government of Ukraine. Uh, but at the present time, as, you, as Assistant Secretary Newland said, uh, defensive lethal op weapons are being reviewed, but it's not something on offer at, at the present time. And my last question is, um, I've heard some commentary that even among Putin's critics within Russia, there are those who do not support giving defensive weapons to Ukraine because ultimately that would lead to the death of Russians uh, and they can't support that. I read that yesterday. I think the Washington Post reported or had some commentary from some of Putin's opponents. So here's my question. If there, Putin says there are no Russian troops in Ukraine. Therefore, if we provided, if, if that's true, he has nothing to worry about, right? As I made clear in my opening, uh, not only do we believe that there are Russian forces in Ukraine, we believe that they are responsible for command and control, arming, financing, directing of this conflict. We also believe that there are uh, many hundreds of Russian dead in Ukraine and that it does pose a vulnerability for uh, the Kremlin politically at home because they are denying they're even active there. I'm sorry, just one quick point. I, I read in your statement, maybe you didn't say this publicly because you had to shorten your statement. Is it not accurate that as these coffins are returning and these bodies are returning to Russia, Russian families of the dead soldiers are being told not to comment on it or they'll be denied death benefits? Yes, and I did say that publicly okay. here. Thank you.